Suspected human remains and hiking boots found during the search for two young Dutch women. I wish you uh, all the best for the rest of your lives and stuff. I'm really going to miss you. What is up, you woo crew? Today, we are covering the mysterious case of Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon. In 2014, a pair of young girls left their home in the Netherlands to travel to Panama. The reason for their trip was twofold, teaching local children and exploring a new country. They had been in Boquet, Panama for just over two weeks when they took their host family's dog for a walk near the Baru volcano. They would never be seen again. People go missing in the wilderness. Inexperienced hikers easily become disoriented. Even experienced hikers can fall or trip. Anyone familiar with the wilds of Panama will tell you that it can be a dangerous place to be. But even when most lost hikers are found, it's easy to see what happened. Their injuries can be easily identified. Search and Rescue can pinpoint where they left the trail. Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon's circumstances are far more confusing. Even six years later, there are still no clear answers as to what happened and why it happened. Let's jump into it. On March 15, 2014, Chris, age 21, and Lisanne, age 22, boarded a plane in their native Amsterdam. The plane's destination? Costa Rica. From Costa Rica, the girls would travel on the Bocas del Toro in Panama, and then take a boat to Isla Colón, where they spent two weeks learning a little Spanish and seeing the sights. It was the beginning of their gap year, which they had been planning and saving for over a year. Though they had attended the same university, they had actually met while working at a restaurant in Amersfoort. As they had become friends, Chris had convinced Lisanne to move into the same student residence. Their gap year approached, and Chris, having traveled to South America previously with her family, suggested that they try Panama. Not only would there be opportunities for backpacking and swimming, two things both of the girls enjoyed doing, they could learn Spanish and volunteer at local schools. Their friends and family had readily donated money for toys and supplies that Chris and Lisanne planned on bringing to the children in Panama. They were scheduled to start volunteering at a school on April 1st, so they arrived in their final destination, Boquet, on March 29th. Though they had received an email on the 26th confirming that they were supposed to start work on the following Monday, the staff of the school where they had planned to volunteer told them that they couldn't accommodate them that week and they would have to try again next week. They were deflated. Even though their plans had only been pushed back a week, both of the girls seemed to take this disruption badly. As they were leaving the school, their plans dashed. Lisanne texted her parents, I am really very disappointed. Having been turned away from the school, they made their way to a suburb of Boquet, Alta Boquet, where they met up with their host family. Their host was Miriam Guara, who would frequently host international students in an adjoining house with its own entrance. Only days later, when the girls disappeared, she would tell the media that the girls seemed smart, shy, and restless. She reported that even though they had limited Spanish, they had managed to communicate that their plans had changed and they had another week off before they started work. They had asked Miriam what sites and activities she recommended, but had eventually resorted to asking for help from the Spanish language school they attended. Together, they put together a few days of sightseeing, hikes, and fun. By April 1st, the Tuesday of the following week, however, 
they had already climbed the volcano near Boquet and taken a tour of a nearby coffee plantation and were running out of new and exciting things to do. They spent most of Tuesday morning trying to decide what to do. Eventually, they decided to hike the Pianista Trail, a popular path frequented by dog walkers. Here's where things get a little fuzzy. Facebook posts from the morning of April 1st by both Lisanne and Chris state that they were planning on walking around the city that day. However, Chris sent her boyfriend a text on Tuesday that said they were planning on going on a hike. This small inconsistency is pretty easily explained away. Their plans changed. A taxi driver said that he dropped the girls off at the trailhead sometime after 1.30 p.m. However, pictures on both of their phones indicated that they had probably started their hike at around 11 a.m. Again, maybe this is easy to explain. The taxi driver was simply mistaken. In the pictures on their phones, the girls are dressed for a short hike in tank tops and shorts. Both are carrying backpacks, but when those backpacks were retrieved weeks later, they would be found to contain only a single water bottle, some snacks, a single passport, their phones, and a digital camera. They clearly were not planning to be out for more than a few hours. When the girls did not return home that evening, their host family was concerned. Miriam reported that they searched Alta Boquet for Chris and Lasanne, but decided to give them the benefit of the doubt. They were young. Maybe they were just out late, having fun. The alarm was not raised until April 2nd, when they failed to show up for an appointment with a tour guide. The tour guide contacted the host family, who confirmed that the girls appeared to have never made it home the previous night. The guide then reached out to the Spanish language school, and it was the school that finally contacted Lisanne and Chris's parents and the police. The search for the missing students did not begin until April 3rd. By April 6th, there had been no sign of either of the girls. Their parents enlisted detectives in the Netherlands, and together they flew to Panama. Despite a $30,000 reward and a 10-day search, it would be months before any sign of the girls was seen again. They were just gone, vanished without a trace in a foreign country. Their parents were despondent. Had they just gotten lost? Had they encountered a dangerous animal? Most frightening of all, had they encountered a dangerous person? Ten weeks after they set out on their ill-fated hike, a local woman appeared at the Boquette police station with reports of a mysterious blue backpack. She said she had found it on the bank of a river near Alto Romero. This was nearly five miles from the Pianista Trail and over ten miles from where they were staying on Boquette. It was quickly identified as Lisanne's backpack. The woman had been to that same location near the river only a single day prior and had not seen the backpack, leading investigators to believe that it had washed up the night prior. However, when they arrived on the scene and actually looked at the backpack, they had found it and its contents to be dry, despite the fact that it had been raining heavily for weeks and the assumption that it had been carried so far from the girl's last known location by the river. Not only was it not wet, it looked brand new. This seemed impossible, considering that it had ostensibly been sitting out in the humid Panamanian rainforest for more than 70 days. The contents appeared to be untouched, though the items offered few clues as to what happened. The backpack contained two bras, two pairs of sunglasses, a water bottle, two cell phones, the digital camera, a medical insurance card belonging to Chris, and a passport belonging to Lisanne. There was also a small amount of money. 
Why had they bothered to bring one person's passport and one person's insurance card? Why were their bras neatly folded at the top of the pack? What the backpack did not contain was just as confusing. They had a compass, a solar power bank, and a knife. None of these items made it into either of the girls' backpacks. Police also noted that there didn't seem to be a key either. Surely, they'd have to have been carrying the key to their room. As the police plugged in the phones and downloaded the images from the digital camera, they began to realize that a dry backpack found on the bank of a river was the least confusing piece of this case. The emergency services calls started just after 4.30 p.m. First, someone tried to place a call to 112. This is the Dutch version of 911. Outside of the Netherlands, it should divert you to the local emergency services. Lisanne and Chris could not get reception, so the call never connected. They next tried calling 911, which also should have diverted them to the local emergency services. Again, the call could not go through. Data taken from the phones shows that they were then turned off and remained off for more than 14 hours. On April 2nd, the calls began again. Every one to two hours, a call was placed to either 112 or 911 using either Chris's or Lisanne's phone. None of them connected, except for the first call that morning, placed just before 7 a.m. The sun would have just been cresting the mountains when they connected to 112 for just a moment, before the call was dropped and they turned the phone off again. When Chris's phone was used to call 112 again at 8.14 a.m., whoever was dialing the number took a screenshot. Investigators believe this was an accident caused by someone with shaky, panicked hands trying to dial the number. The phones are again switched off, this time for more than 19 hours. On day three, they go live again, following that same pattern of trying to call for help every one to two hours. There were no successful attempts to reach 112 or 911, other than that early morning call on the second day. In total, they made nearly 80 calls. By day four, the calls are fewer and farther between. On day five, Lisanne's phone died. Chris's phone, however, continued to be turned on and off until April 11, even though the data mining shows that her battery was at 50% when they left Boquette. Between April 7th and April 10th, Chris's phone was completely dark. It blipped on again at 10.51 a.m. on April 11th and was turned off again at 11.51 a.m. It was never turned on again. It's hard to know which of the girls were making these calls if, in fact, it was either of them. There was a detail, however, that made investigators' blood run cold. Lisanne's phone died on the 5th. The next time a phone was used, it was, of course, Chris's phone. However, whoever was trying to use Chris's phone did not know the PIN. Up until April 5th, whoever had been using Chris's phone knew the correct code and entered it correctly each time the phone was turned on and was used to attempt to reach emergency services. Suddenly, on April 6th, there were several attempts to enter an incorrect code. A correct code would never again be entered until the phone was switched off for good on April 11th, despite wrong codes being entered dozens of times in the intervening days. Even in 2014, all smartphones had a function that allows someone to make an emergency call, even if they do not know the phone's PIN. If it had just been Lisanne trying desperately to call for help, even though Chris had already expired, she would not have needed to unlock the phone to do it. 
someone was desperate to unlock Chris's phone, and investigators concluded that was unlikely to have been Lisanne. The call logs were not the only concerning piece of data the investigators gleaned from the technology in the backpack. When they turned on the Canon SX270HS digital camera, they found a series of 133 pictures, taken starting on April 1st. The first set of photos is completely innocuous. They are extremely typical photos for a pair of young adults to have taken. Lisanne posing at the hike summit, Chris posing at the hike summit. There are a series of selfies. They snap a few pictures of waterfalls and other particularly pretty scenery along the path. Being a digital camera, every single picture they took is carefully labeled and timestamped. All of these pictures of two smiling girls are taken before 1.30 p.m. It appears as though they did not turn around and head back down the trail when they were finished taking pictures, even though this is what signs on the trail and online guides recommend. Instead, they forged ahead, having read that there were a few waterfalls on the other side of the summit. The last picture, taken on April 1st, before 2 p.m., is of Chris in a small gully, surrounded by moss-covered rocks and thick vegetation. What follows are a series of pictures that become more mysterious the farther the investigators scrolled into the camera roll. First, there is a picture of Chris taken from behind, at a considerable distance. She is looking back towards whoever has the camera, and her face looks worried. There are a few similar shots of Chris. Nothing looks particularly amiss, but in comparison to the wide smiles captured earlier in the day, she looks serious. Her expression looks strained, her poses awkward. In the middle of these pictures, there is evidence that one or more of the photos was deleted from the camera. None of the other pictures the girls had taken with this camera during their trip had been deleted. This might not seem that strange, but in light of what the police found next, it indicates that there was something seriously wrong. After 2 p.m. on April 1st, it appears that no one used the camera for seven days. Suddenly, on the 8th of April, the camera was powered on again, and someone took more than 90 photos over the course of three hours, those hours being 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. There is something haunting about these photos. None of them seem to be of anything specific. It was as if, in a daze, someone was snapping pictures of the darkness. Maybe they were trying to capture the image of someone stalking them. Maybe they were simply trying to use the flash as a light. No theory completely explains this set of photos. In the pictures, you can see jungle, a dirt path, or rocks, illuminated by the camera's flash. Some may be an attempt at illuminating a path, though it seems unlikely. A camera flash in the pitch darkness would probably blind someone rather than help them see. Other images are much harder to parse. Some seem to be pictures of the sky or of a plant sticking out of a rock. One particularly disturbing image appears to be just the back of Chris's head with just the hint of blood in her hair. Several of the pictures appear to have light orbs and other light artifacts. None seem to have been taken while moving. Almost all have a disorienting perspective. It's impossible to tell if the person taking them was standing up or sitting down, much less in what direction they were pointing the camera. Even those familiar with the trail and the surrounding area have had difficulty locating areas where the girls, or whoever had the camera, could have taken these pictures. There is something simply not right about all of these shots. Pictures taken at night 
are naturally unsettling, yes. But the odd angles and unrecognizable terrain make these photos especially troubling. After the backpack was found, locals were able to quickly locate a set of remains. By June 19th, 2014, all that would ever be found of Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon was located along the same river where Lisanne's backpack was found. In total, 33 bones would be discovered, along with a pair of jean shorts and one shoe from each of the students. The most chilling finding was Lisanne's left foot. It was discovered still inside her boot, the boot's laces still cinched tight. Investigators noted that the cut that had severed the ankle from the leg was clean. Because of the lack of blood, it was likely that it had happened after Lisanne was already dead. Nearby the shoe, a piece of Lisanne's skin was found rolled into a ball. The other notable discovery was half of a pelvic bone. It would be identified as Chris's pelvic bone. While all of Chris's bones seemed to have been picked clean and bleached by the hot sun, Lisanne's remains showed less decomposition. I really want you to know that, uh, that I really like you guys. None of the remains provided much information about what happened to the pair, especially because the bones themselves were so scattered. The official story is that Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon fell to their death crossing a monkey bridge during their hike. A monkey bridge is a flimsy bridge made of three wires that does admittedly look very easy to fall from. But there is no evidence that the girls ever made it to this dangerous part of the trail. Investigators have since modified this story, claiming that maybe Chris fell either from the bridge or while trying to climb the wall of the gully captured in their pictures. This would have happened in the mid-afternoon on April 1st. Chris held on until April 5th or 6th, both girls calling for help to no avail. Chris either passed away or sank into a coma. By the 8th, Lisanne was disoriented and desperate. There were only a few hours of battery life left on Chris's phone. She didn't know the code. All she could do was take a picture of Chris, dead or dying, and the surrounding area, hoping to be able to lead search and rescue back to her body and hike until she could get better reception. It was simply a hiking accident, largely the fault of the girls themselves, who went past the safe part of the trail and into the jungle of Panama. This theory doesn't explain the sheer glut of pictures taken in between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. Locals also claim that it is very difficult to get lost in this area, as there is a network of well-marked trails. Many who knew the girls also claim that they would never be stupid enough to attempt to cross the monkey bridge on their own. The explanation spurs more questions than it answers. How did Lisanne's backpack turn up dry and perfectly preserved on the bank of a river 10 miles away? More chillingly, who erased the picture on their camera? And who was trying to unlock Chris's phone relentlessly for five days? Why did they stop taking pictures for seven days? Why didn't they attempt to send any text messages? Why did they only ever try to call emergency services and not their parents, boyfriends, or host family? Dick Steffens, a criminalist hired by the Kremers and Froons, guessed that the pictures might have actually been an attempt to signal someone. Perhaps the girls were stuck, either immobilized by injuries or subdued by someone and were trying to use the flash of the camera to signal passing planes or vehicles for help. He also noted that the remains found along the river seemed to be far too clean to have decomposed naturally. And why were some pieces of Lisanne found intact, 
like the rolled up strip of skin? Why were their bras folded up and stuffed in the backpack? To this day, no one has been able to offer a theory that comprehensively explains the evidence gathered by police. Some have claimed that the orbs in many of the nighttime photos indicate the presence of ghosts. This is a huge catch-all bucket that could explain the erratic behavior of taking the photographs. A much more likely but still frightening possibility is that the girls wandered off the trail and into someone who recognized them as vulnerable. They were clearly not from Panama, and while they were both fit, were small and could have been easily overpowered. Maybe this attacker let them keep their phones, knowing they wouldn't be able to get reception. Maybe they ferreted them away and hid them when he was around. Perhaps Chris expired first, and it was Lisanne desperately trying to open her friend's phone to call someone, anyone. Maybe they'd gotten a picture of him on their camera, which he deleted. The reason Chris began to look concerned was that they had just encountered a frightening individual. He might have even been the person taking the photos, forcing them to pose as if nothing was wrong. And all those pictures, taken in the early morning hours of April 8th, were Lisanne trying to signal into the darkness that she was alive and needed help. After she died, probably on the 11th, after Chris's phone was switched on and off for the last time, their killer stripped and scattered their bones and possessions, hoping no one would ever find enough of either girl to identify them, or, at the very least, identify what happened to them. No matter what happened, whether the girls were stalked by a supernatural entity, were attacked by a wild animal, hunted by a human monster, or simply got lost or injured and could not call for help, the image painted of their last days is terrifying. Alone in the wilderness, their clean water running low, food in short supply, knowing that they were going to die knowing no help was coming. Imagine having your phone and trying desperately to call for help, knowing that each time you switch it on and the call does not connect is another precious bit of battery you've wasted. You can't save your friend. You have to watch her die. You can't even unlock her phone to try to call your parents. All you can do is dial emergency services over and over, knowing the call will never go through, until you two die. It must have been a special kind of torture. I want you to know that, uh, that I really like you guys.